In Luke 10, chapters 1 through, or chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 and 16 through 20, Jesus sends his followers out with a simple message. Live in the now. Don't worry about success or failure and accept the generosity of others. Let go of all expectations and focus on God. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place everywhere. He himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to your feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The word of God spoken. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Thanks, Tammy. Okay, so (laughs) the lectionary clearly gives us an interesting pairing of stories this week. We hear of the healing of Naaman in 2 Kings that we opened with today in the sending of the 70, the 70 that Tammy just read about which may have you wondering what a military commander's healing in the Jordan River has to do with Jesus sending 70 disciples out to share the gospel. At least in-house, there's a little of this going on. I imagine the same is happening at home. Part of the answer, though, may lie in the question that Naaman's servants ask him when he's struggling to accept God's healing on God's terms. Remember, if the prophet Elisha had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more then when all he said to you, all he asked you to do was just wash and be clean? It sounds simple enough, and yet Naaman balks, right? And we know from Naaman's story that he's a decorated military general, a man of great wealth and power and influence, and we know he has the ear of his king and the respect of his soldiers and the confidence of a man who expects things to happen his way until he contracts leprosy, this painful, debilitating, and socially isolating disease. And to his shock and surprise, that discovers that the once surefire ways of getting something healed don't work. There's not enough money. There's not enough anything that will help him in this situation. And lo and behold, he finds himself taking medical advice from a servant, and not just any servant, but a young girl like one among us today, a girl, a servant, a slave, and wait for it, a Jew. That's what he's reduced to, because now he's fairly desperate, and she holds the key, although he doesn't quite recognize it in the moment, but he's fairly desperate. And so he decides to follow her advice and shows up at the prophet Elisha's door with caravans of silver and gold and festive garments, only to be sent away with not so much as a respectful hello. Elisha doesn't even come out and greet this man of great importance. Just perfunctory and personal instructions to go of 
all places, the Jordan, which is really a muddy stream, and take a bath there. His face probably looked a little like mine in that moment, because it wasn't really the expected response to either his status or his plea for healing or his expectations, and Naaman is not buying it. Mm -mm. He returns home in a huff, loathing the prophet for his insubordination, cursing his leprosy, and nursing a fairly bruised ego, not knowing that there will be more, until his servants posed that question. If the prophet had commanded something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? His servants know that their master enjoys proving himself, that he wants and is indeed accustomed to earning his accolades, that he feels the same way, apparently, about being healed. They know that he, he holds his own courage and fortitude and skill and intelligence in exceedingly high regard. Just ask him, right? So having posed their first question to pique his interest, the servants bravely suggest the alternative that says, why not do the easier thing? Surely the easier thing is easier. And we, from our armchairs, would say, well, in theory, but we don't necessarily believe it either. All too often, the easy thing doesn't feel very easy at all because it requires things of us that aren't about money or festive garments or letters from a king. Sometimes doing the easy thing humbles us, disarms us, challenges us, makes us feel silly and vulnerable. And we're not very comfortable with those things any more than Naaman was. It also eliminates the excuses. Which one among us is incapable of going to a river and taking a bath effectively, right? but we tend to want some kind of divine encounter. We want to feel good. We want to look good. We want that arduous trial so that we can prove our worth spiritually and otherwise as we sweat and struggle and show off because it makes us look good. Like we've somehow slaved and slaved to earn whatever is in front of us, but biblically we know that's just not how God works. So if Naaman's story has anything to teach us, perhaps it's that sometimes God works through something simple. Often things that wait quietly in front of us. But consider what keeping it simple will mean for Naaman. Once at the river, God essentially tells him to take off his armor and take off all of his clothes. Everybody's there with him. He doesn't travel without a group. All of his people are watching him. And then he is to step into this tepid, muddy, smelly water of the Jordan. And it's so low that he'll have to steep all the way down to get in. And then wash. And wash again. And now wash again and again and again and again and again seven times. Wash until his need to buy or earn or impress or demand or manipulate or control his way into the healing presence of God has also been washed away along with his leprosy. Today's story from Luke about Jesus commissioning the 70 echoes the same message in a way. As you go forth, keep it simple, make it easy, really simple. How? Jesus tells the 70 to take nothing at all. No money, no purse, no sandals, no anything, just what they happen to be wearing, and go. I don't know about you, but my mind would suddenly be busy going, well, maybe just, is there, can, do I have pockets? Can I put like a, a change of underwear, a little toothpaste, a little soap, anything, really? And when we get to that place where we go, okay, but we may miss what's most important and how he sends them forth. That the work is urgent and it won't be easy, that sometimes we will feel like lambs among foxes or wolves, and sometimes when we think the harvest is ready, it won't be. He tells them all that. He also sends them in pairs, so they may not have the extra clothing and stuff with them, but they're not alone. They are with one another. Jesus also sends them with a word of peace, of blessing. They have only to declare peace wherever they go with an open mind and then gratefully receive whatever hospitality is offered without exception or expectation or judgment about how those they encounter will respond. Easy, sort of, 
the words are clear, the preparation is clear, and yet what Jesus sets before these 70 really doesn't feel very simple or very easy until we recognize that the real task he sets before them is to keep it simple, to just let go and let God be everything. To discover the abundance and nearness of God by simply by living simply and vulnerably, to rely on the grace of, and hospitalities of others, which allows them to extend God's peace back. Can you see it happening? To stay in one place and encounter, engage, go deep, to live in faith with these people that they depend on for sustenance and shelter. To speak peace first and last. Now, Luke doesn't tell us if the disciples pushed back with or pummeled Jesus with what ifs which some of us might be tempted to do, before they went and did what he asks. We do know, though, that when the disciples returned to Jesus, presumably having done exactly as he asked them, they're filled with joy. As they describe all the wonders they've witnessed, Jesus says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning, meaning that when we do, when they do what Jesus asks, of them, of us, when we keep it simple, when we travel the easy path of vulnerability and humility and love and peacemaking, evil trembles, demons fall, the world changes, and God's kingdom begins to come. Even so, it's amazing how often we complicate the situation. Is that really what God wants me to do? How will I know? How how do I hear God's voice and discern God's plan? We get so caught up in that need that we miss what's right in front of us. God is showing us in a myriad of present moments, right in front of us, opportunities to simply be who we are and who we say we are, God's beloved. As we pray and listen and learn and love and act, as we break bread and drink wine, bear the burden, together share the peace as we love God with all our heart our soul, our mind, our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. And do those things, make that the luggage that we pack first and always. Naaman's story is one of reversals. Festive robes give way to nakedness. Kings and generals make way for handmaids and servants. And pomp surrenders to prophecy. Dignity bows to wholeness and faith. Saving, healing faith emerges in a muddy river of all places. Likewise, the story of the 70 is a story of abundance flowing from simplicity. Purseless, barefooted house guests, house guests usher in God's kingdom, speaking peace into villagers' homes, navigating the world as lambs amidst the wolves, multiplying joy by simply being who Jesus, who God has asked them to be. Now, mind you, 10 years in, I've seen this scripture at least twice before as a pastor and a few more times over a lifetime. So as I look at applying this to myself for the umpteenth time, because we are kind of like the disciples, we're a little slow sometimes to learn things, packing light comes, up, comes to mind again. Nowadays, I tend to pack as light as possible. I really don't care to carry anything if I don't have to, so I will be looking for any clothing with pockets that I can stuff so I don't have to carry anything, not a print, nothing. On a quilting trip to, uh, or a friend's, I went to a friend's house who's a quilter a few years back, and she lives in California, and it's summertime, and so we discussed, because I was gonna spend the week with her, so I'd be at her house where there's a, wait for it, washer and dryer, and I knew that we would be shopping for fabric and we would be sewing in things so there would be a lot to bring home. And I thought, well, gosh, I wonder what happens if packing like this time is just maybe four days worth of clothing and we'll, for a nine-day trip, we'll wash it a few times. They won't care. And I pack the rest of my suitcase with those funky, air-filled, cushy uh, spacers, right, that protect breakables and things so that it wouldn't look like I'd been in the washing machine by the time... I got there, you get the idea. So I have two-thirds of my suitcases effectively empty. Yay, and did I fill it when I came back? Of course I did. However, what crossed my mind was the realization that if I can make room 
and go to that extra effort for something I'm passionate about, like creative work and quilting, surely it's a simple thing to make room in this way and more for God. That's also a part of how I've come to this place in my life. I am not an ordained elder in the church. I am a licensed local pastor in the church. And when you follow that particular clergy track in the Methodist church, it means you jump right in. You, the, the only preparation you have is 10 days, uh, intense days of licensing school that teach you everything you need to lead a church. Right. It's the Reader's Digest condensed version of, and it, there's baptism and weddings and funerals and lions and tigers and bears and, yeah, and off you go. So local pastors are actually boots on the ground working as they go through school. And the, the educational process is different as well. We take four courses a year or their equivalent, graduate level courses, theological courses, each year for five years while we are working. So, you know, if the Old Testament study is in the fourth year and you're in the first, I call that packing light, I'm just saying. What it meant for me was to do exactly what this scripture says, what Jesus says, keep it simple, go. Don't worry, don't be fearful. Get out of your mind that terror that says, oh, heaven help me if someone, a biblical scholar, comes my way and challenges me to... Uh, a biblical duel because I will fail. I don't have that kind of background or scholarly stuff or education. I don't, I, all, I, all I have is who I am and the ability to show up and learn it. Isn't that what Jesus was asking? I think so. Even when you feel like you're going right off the cliff into the unknown without a net, which has happened many times, God's always there. There's always people around you. There are ways to, to find your way forward by doing this work this way, exactly as Jesus describes it. What did I find out? I didn't have to know everything or bring everything or pack everything because whether or not I felt prepared, God had called me to do this work. The great commandment really does hold and in living this way to the best of our ability, certainly to the best of mine, there is great joy. Something to be said for what he's asking of the disciples and us. Inspired by Sent Ahead by Steve Garnis Holmes, these words, to help boost this up a notch. Moreover, we don't just happen to be here. We've been sent here to this place of uncertainty and the unknown to convey a presence. We are not sent away, but ahead, paired with the one who goes with us. It is not our success, but our love and courage that will help us fulfill this purpose. The path needs us. The journey creates us. And if we simply keep it simple and go, Joy, the kingdom of God, waits. May it be so. Amen and amen.